Buongiorno, buongiorno. Buongiorno, buongiorno, buongiorno. Welcome to the Da Vinci Machines exhibition. My name is Mark Rogers, and I'm the director of the Da Vinci exhibit here for North America. Every one of the models you see here were made by third generation artisans at the Museum of Learning Leonardo da Vinci, as close as possible to the drawings and the codices of Leonardo da Vinci. Leonardo da Vinci was, actually was born April 15th, 1452. He was actually born out of wedlock to a servant of his father. His father was a notary in the law profession, and his mother was one of his servants. As a result of being born out of wedlock, he wasn't allowed to go into the family business. Thank God. And as a result of also being born out of wedlock, he wasn't allowed to go to school. In fact, for the first 14 years of his life, he was let to roam free. You know what he did for the first 14 years of his, of his life? He updated his Facebook page every day. He twittered with his iPhone and he had 20, 250 cable stations and he watched television all day. You know, actually he didn't do that. You know what he did? He taught himself how to read and how to write and how to paint until his father recognized this unbelievable talent that he had and finally got him into schooling at the age of 14. You know what Leonardo da Vinci needed in his life? The same thing we do, money. He needed money to survive and he formed out his design talents to the dukes and lords and kings of the day, well all the artisans did, to design these military weapons both offensive and defensive. Italy wasn't the one country that we know of today. It was all these different warring factions. Each one of the dukes and lords and kings were trying to outdo the other one with these machines of war. You know what kind of the sad part about the story is so far? What's changed over the last 550 years? Absolutely nothing. We're still making war machines to make money to kill people. Is that insane? But you know what? That's actually a different tour. We're not gonna go on that tour today. We're not going to talk about the military industrial complex in this world. We're going to talk about Leonardo da Vinci. Leonardo da Vinci was under the auspices of the Duke of Milan for 20 years, the longest benefactor of his life. He spent hours and hours and hours on his drawings, making sure each one was absolutely perfect, each one was as correct as possible. But on his drawings and on his codices, he always left one or two key factors out of his drawings. And in case somebody ran off with these codices, they couldn't make these machines of war work without his knowledge, without his consent. He basically designed in his own copyrights to his own drawings. This was actually, he called the war wagon, and he designed this for the Duke of Milan. He designed it one way for the horse and rider to be positioned here and literally pull this into the field of battle. He designed it a second way for the horse and rider to be positioned in a forward position facing this machine and literally push this into the field of battle. You know what? You've already determined you didn't want any one of those two jobs. It was an interlocking gear system. And as the wheels would come around, it would turn the gearbox on, on top and the blades would come around and literally mow down the opponents. Holy cow. Can you imagine? Can you imagine being on the battlefield and seeing this happen? So this had a, a psychological and a physical impact on the opposition. But you know what? He was truly a man of peace. And I have many examples to go through the exhibit as I'll tell you truly what a man of peace he was. They said there was another reason he left one or two or key elements out of his drawings. You know why? He didn't really want them to work. They said when he would go through villages and towns around Florence and Milan and Rome, he would buy birds in cages at the center squares of town. And when he got to the edge of town, he'd open the cage up and set them free. That doesn't sound like a man of war to me, does it? It sounds like a man of peace. And I have many, many examples of this exhibit to show you. Come with me into the exhibit. I've got a lot to show you, and we've got a lot to talk about. There are three constant themes to the exhibit that I'd like to bring to your attention. When we get a chance to explore all these magnificent machines that brought us into the modern era that we now live in, they said there's 2,500 of his inventions and his designs and his theories that we use every day in our life. And he designed every one of these machines with only knowing four power sources. The only four power sources that Leonardo da Vinci knew were wind, water, horsepower, and manpower. And what a concept. By today's standards, what? They're all green and they don't destroy our earth. 
The second constant theme through the exhibit that we're going to find. Not only did he invent a lot of things, he updated a lot of inventions. This was his update of the catapult. The catapult had been around for centuries before Leonardo da Vinci, but Leonardo da Vinci was attributed with bringing it up to the modern times of the day, of giving it a wrench and a lever and a rope design that they could pull it, they could crank this catapult into place, and then when it was, was released, the rope would unwind like a spring-like effect, like a, like a slingshot effect, and whatever they were trying to catapult would go better, faster, straighter, and be more accurate. The third constant theme for the exhibit is over the last 550 years, the material has changed, the manufacturing processes have changed, but its basic design has withstood the test of time. This he called the martyr boat, today we call the battleship. He designed a 360 degree platform to be placed upon the top of the boat and the gearing system could be turned by the sailors. And as they turned this, uh, this 360 degree platform, they could, pl they could put guns and cannons and mortar fire on top and fire around in a 360 degree fashion, just like our gun turrets on our battleships today. What's changed? The material and the manufacturing process, but his design has withstood the test of time. This is the famous tank that was also designed for the Duke of Milan. And just like that war wagon we saw previously, you didn't want any one of those two jobs. You know what? You didn't want any one of these jobs. He designed this tank originally for horses, but they thought the horses inside would get so spooked they couldn't handle it. So they decided to what? Let's put men inside there instead. Wow, what a concept. It goes to what I was saying before, that if you built it exactly like Leonardo da Vinci designed it in his CODIS, it wouldn't have operated. He designed it originally as one bar for men to operate in a rowing fashion. But if you notice, if it's one bar, nothing happens. But by simply cutting the bar into two, his own Da Vinci Code, his own copyright, so to speak, that each one of the gears would begin to operate independently and the entire tank would begin to function. He designed it for soldiers to stand on top of this platform and the top of the tank would be then be lowered down over the top. Can you guess the idea where he got for the top of this tank? A tortoise shell, a turtle shell for protection. The soldiers would stand on top of this platform. The top would be lowered down. They would gaze out onto the battlefield, determine what would be happening, and then give orders and guidance to the soldiers inside the tank. I mean, just for a moment, can you imagine the sound and the noise and the chaos that would have been going on inside that machine? He was into very complex designs like this. He was also into very simple inventions over here. He was into weights and levers and pulleys and counterweights. What he was always trying to do was maximize one man's strength, that a handful of men could do the work of 20 or 25 men. This he called the assault ladder. Today is predecessor to all of our modern day firefighting equipment and all of our rescue equipment. He designed this simple counterweighted design where the heavy weight would, would, would counterweight the weight of the heavy log. A handful of soldiers could then roll this up to the, uh, to the side of a, a castle wall on the battlefield and the soldiers could easily adjust this to the size of a castle wall and the soldiers could run up into the field, up, 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 up into the castle. When the Duke of Milan ordered this from Leonardo da Vinci, he said, Leo, what I want to be able to do is get in and out of castles quickly. And this is the design that he came up with. Another very simple design for Leonardo da Vinci was this, he called the excavator, his predecessor to all of our modern day digging equipment, all of our modern day excavators. Once again, you see handles on it, so that meant it was man operated, it was man driven. So the men would pull down on this counterweighted design. The blade would come around and dig into the soil. As it dug into the soil, as the trench was being dug, it would be on tree trunk rollers. And they would roll it along as the trench was being dug, just like our excavating equipment today. So this particular design had military and civilian applications to it. But the absolute coolest thing, the neatest thing about Leonardo da Vinci was he designed things he couldn't even make. Basically everything that was available to Leonardo da Vinci was available through a blacksmith shop that had to be pounded out. That casting hadn't reached any kind of the potential as we know it today. These are actual mortar rounds from the time of Napoleon that the Museum of Leonardo da Vinci was able to acquire. Napoleon wanted his armaments on the battlefield to go better, faster, straighter and be more accurate. Napoleon went back 200 years to the drawings and the codices and the aerodynamic designs of Leonardo da Vinci from 200 years prior and copied th these designs so his own armaments could be more effective on the battlefield. But enough about these war machines. This behind me is a reproduction of the fresco of the Battle of Angaria. 
The reason that we have presented it in this exhibition is because the story behind this fresco is so cool, is so neat, that we had to share it with you. The Battle of Ingaria was a battle that took place over in Italy that pitted the Florentine army against the Milanese, the people from Milan. The Florentine army won, and soon after the battle, the powers that be in Florence decided to commemorate this incredible victory of battle. And they hired and contracted with Leonardo da Vinci to paint this fresco in the Hall of 500 in the old palace in downtown Florence. One day, soon after he began, the powers that be that hired Leonardo da Vinci decided to show up one day and see how it was coming along. They looked up and they saw Leonardo da Vinci painting the Battle of Ingaria. And they realized immediately that they'd been tricked. That Leonardo had turned the tables on his own benefactors. He didn't paint this painting to show this incredible victory of battle because you know what? Leonardo knows what we know. There hasn't been an incredible victory of battle since battles have begun. Leonardo da Vinci called war Bastille madness. And he wanted to show not what the government wanted him to show of this incredible victory of battle, but he wanted to show from the human side the human toll that war takes on the individual. Over the next 225 years, they covered it up, they put a wall up in front of it, they plastered in front of it, and 225 years later, they were, when they were renovating the museum, they took the wall down and they had realized they had covered up Leonardo's masterpiece of the Battle of Ingaria. Now it's more commonly known as the Lost Leonardo. It was the first time in recorded history that someone had stepped outside the box, outside this government propaganda machine, not to show you of what the government wanted you to see of this incredible victory of battle because Leonardo knows that there is none. Leonardo wanted to show from the human side the toll that war takes on the individual. And that's what he wanted to show in the Battle of Ingaria, now more commonly known as the Lost Leonardo. 550 years ago, Leonardo da Vinci designed the original robot. He had dreams of mechanical knights that could be wound up, could be sent into battle, and a human being wouldn't have to die. He was tall, he was handsome, he was gregarious. Everybody wanted to be associated with him. And all the royalty of the day invited him to all the party, all the parties that they had. And you know what they would tell him? Leo, come by the parties, but bring your robotics with you. Show up with one or two of your, of your robots, and he would show up and he would, with, with, his, with his toys and with his robotic designs to entertain and delight his audience. You know what? He would be top on my guest list today. He'd be top on my guest list today. This design from Leonardo da Vinci is actually one of my favorites in the entire exhibition. He named and called this design his Scorpion Boat. What this boat was designed to do was on the high sea of battle. This was designed to float up next to an opposing ship. As it would pull up next to the opposing ship, the sailors would extend this scorpion-like hook that would extend out and literally cut and slice the sail of the boat so it could, the boat couldn't maneuver or get away and be essentially dead in the water. He designed A-frames for the rowers. As the rowers got closer and closer to the boat, if they were getting shot with arrows or getting hurdles with missiles of some sort, they'd be somewhat protected. You know why this is my favorite exhibition in the entire ex exhibit? Is can you imagine on the high sea of battle and you're in an opposing ship, way off in the distance, you see the sh this ship slowly coming at you. As it gets closer and closer and closer to you, you begin to talk among your shipmates and you begin to think and begin to say to each other, what is this thing? And as it gets closer and closer to you, as it pulls up next to your boat and you see this scorpion-like hook extend out, all of a sudden it dawns on you and your shipmates that what? that they sent this thing to destroy you. And then the chaos that would have broken out aboard that ship. Leonardo da Vinci's first passion in life was obviously painting, but his second passion was flight. He wanted to fly like a bird from the beginning of time. We've all wanted to fly like a bird. He studied birds and bats and wings and flight patterns of all sizes and shapes and dimensions. On the flight display is the closest design that he came to physically mimicking a bird in flight. This was his bat wing glider. Now keep in mind, he didn't have all the bugs worked out of all of his inventions. He theoretically thought it would operate by the glider pilot's head would go through the opening. The glider pilot would hold on to either side in an attempt to manipulate the wing in flight. <laughs> yeah, right, huh? The Museum of Leonardo da Vinci in Florence actually has another name for this design over in Florence. You know what they call it? The decapitator. Because as soon as this thing hit the ground, your head came off. This is where Saturday Night Live meets the Renaissance, I like to say, because you know what we need for this invention? 
more volunteers because the first five didn't fare so well, if you know what I mean. But in all of his writings and his codices and his notes, he theorized, and he theorized correctly, that for men to fly and to fly safely, that your wings had to be parallel at all times to the horizon. He designed the original inclimeter. The inclimeter is above our boats and our planes today are highly computerized with gyroscopes and lasers. But this very simple design would simply tell the glider pilot that, hey, your wings aren't parallel to the horizon. He designed it to be in a glass bell so it wouldn't be affected by wind currents. He designed it to be on the glider in flight with the pilot. So in flight, the glider pilot could look over, determine if his wings were or were not parallel, and know to bring his wings back parallel to the horizon. You know what this was? The first onboard instrument, 500 years ahead of his time. This is probably Leonardo da Vinci's most famous aerodynamic design. He called it his air screw. You've seen it a thousand times in commercials and cartoons, but most people don't know how he actually intended it to operate. How he actually intended this machine to operate is the men would stand on this platform, hold on to these bars, and literally run around in a circle and attempt to air screw up into the air like our present day helicopter. Over at the Museum of Leonardo da Vinci, they teach courses every year to young students. And each year they ask the students to take his ideas and his designs and put them on our modern day inventions. And that's truly what the one student did. The one student positioned the air screw on top of our present day helicopter, which it was truly meant to be. Hey, I got a question. Did this thing work? Nah, it didn't work. There's a thousand reasons we know today why this wouldn't have worked. It was too heavy, the men would wear out. But the idea was he was using manpower and air as an element to achieve and perform this function. Leonardo da Vinci had absolutely no way of knowing this, but you can tell by looking at this design what he was trying to do. He was actually somehow trying to mimic the design of our internal combustion engines and our electric motors of today, where this energy could be set up and sustained and sustained for a long period of time to help perform this task. Think about this for a minute. Can you imagine if Leonardo da Vinci would have had an electric motor or a power source or an, or an internal combustion engine? I tell you where we'd be today. We'd be 500 years ahead of ourselves. You know what? This is another job he didn't want. You didn't want that war wagon job. You didn't want that tank job. And you didn't want this job. He designed these huge logs to be taken by the military on long trucks and journeys. He, de he designed these huge logs to be carried by horses and oxen and men. Who'd want that job? And when they got to a, a ravine or a crevice or an opening that they needed to get across, they would construct these bridges with, without using any nails uh, of these huge logs. The army would then walk across the bridge. And then you know what they would do? Pack it up and take it with them so it wouldn't be around for the enemy to use later. What a great idea. This was his update of the Archimedes screw. The Archimedes screw was a design used to get water from a ground floor level to a second or third floor level. What this design was supposed to do and designed to do was as the workman turned this screw-like device and design, it was designed to pick up a cup of water and a bubble of air. A cup of water and a bubble of air and the bubble of water would move the water up to the second or third floor level. Leonardo da Vinci figured out how to waterproof leather by coating it with animal fat. He designed the original life preserver. The design hasn't been approved upon in over 550 years. As much as Leonardo da Vinci wanted to fly, he wanted to go under the sea. And he knew that you had to breathe in fresh air, and you had to expel the old air. He even designed something that suspiciously resembles our regulators of today. That's a great trivia question. Who invented our regulators of today? It was Jacques Cousteau. Jacques Cousteau invented our regulators of, of today. So just file that away. You never know when you need it. But in all of his writings, Leonardo da Vinci wrote that he thought this design looked very sinister and very evil. And he wrote in his codices, due to the very evil nature of man, somebody would surely take this invention and try to hurt someone with it. And unfortunately for us, he completely abandoned the entire project because he thought someone would take this and actually try to harm someone. So we had to wait another 500 years for Jacques Cousteau to invent the regulator. 
Since the tour has begun, you've heard me say the word CODIS quite a bit. A CODIS is basically a large book of the day. When Leonardo da Vinci died, they put all of his drawings into these huge things called CODISes. In 1966, a monk was going through one of Leonardo da Vinci's old codices that had been gone through a thousand times before. As he was paging through the book, he felt that one of the pages in the book felt a little bit thicker than the other pages. He thought that was a little strange, so he began to play with the page and he began to peel it apart. And as he began to peel it apart, he discovered that there had been two pages that had been stuck together for over 500 years. Do you know what was on the other page? The bicycle. Leonardo da Vinci designed the original bicycle. But more important than inventing the bicycle was he invented the link chain that operated it. As the energy is being created, it's being transferred from one gear to another gear to another gear to help sustain this task easily. Leonardo's biggest problem was he couldn't make the chain because casting hadn't evolved that far yet. So they theorized that he used rope and leather and straps and strings to perform this function. In 1497, Leonardo da Vinci designed the original ball bearing. Over the last 550 years, the material has changed, the manufacturing processes have changed, but his basic design has withstood the test of time. I was giving this one tour to this group of eighth graders not too long ago, and I asked them simply during my tour, I said, hey, where do we use the ball bearing? And all 30 of them, there were 15 guys and 15 girls, they all looked at me like they didn't know what I was talking about, and they said, I don't know. And I went, oh my goodness, in every wheel that turns has a ball bearing. Every car wheel, every manufacturing wheel, every rollerblade, every bicycle, every skateboard has a ball bearing. Every wheel that turns around in a circle has a ball bearing. And Leonardo da Vinci designed it. They have been able to improve upon it in 500 years. This is Leonardo da Vinci's famous gear study. This is predecessor to all of our modern day gearing system, all of our modern day cars. As the energy is being created by the workmen, it's being transferred from one gear to another gear to another gear and being able to be sustained easily. On Leonardo da Vinci's own design, he figured out very quickly there were two major problems with his own design. First of all, the problem was that the friction in it would wear it down. The second problem was if one or two or three or four of the teeth broke off on the gears, the entire gear would shut down. You know what? Leonardo da Vinci figured that out. He was Leonardo da Vinci. He designed what he called the original worm screw that we call the corkscrew mechanism. As the energy is being created by the workmen, the energy is being transferred from the worm screw to the gear. There's many different points of contact, much less friction. If one or two or three or four of the teeth broke off, it wouldn't necessarily have shut the gear down. But the most ingenious part about this design was what? That it was an one-way transfer. The energy could be transferred from the worm screw to the gear, but it cannot be transferred in reverse. Where do we use that design every day in our life? Every guitar, every bass, every violin, every cello, every stringed musical instrument uses this exact design. 1497 was a very good year for Leonardo da Vinci. He designed the original ball bearing and he also designed the original cam hammer. What it was, was he figured out by cutting the arc of the wood as the workman turned the cam hammer device, it would draw the hammer back the same way every time. So you could now have consistent, even pressure and you could now control the production process. Leonardo da Vinci's first passion in life was painting. His second passion was flight, but his third passion was he wanted to find the secret to perpetual motion. He had small, medium, and large perpetual motion machines. As one weight would drop, it would be replaced by another weight, and another weight, and another weight, and theoretically, it would just keep going, and going, and going, and going. After years of study, experimentation, and trial and error, he finally came to the conclusion that what? It doesn't exist. At some point, some energy has to be put back in the system to keep it operating. As we know now, Leonardo da Vinci made his money by doing his military machine designs. He also made his money by doing portraits. He had a waiting list of people that wanted to be painted by him. In fact, the last year and a half, they just found another one of his portraits called La Bella Principessa. You can Google it, it's all over the internet. They've now determined it's a Leonardo original and by his hand. And you know what he wanted to do with this huge backlog of portraits that uh, he had commissioned to paint? He wanted to speed it up. He wanted to get the commission. He wanted to get the painting done. He wanted to get paid. He wanted to get on to his next 
project. So to help him do that, he designed this mirror chamber. The subject could walk into the mirror chamber, he would close the door, he would look through from the outside, he could see around the subject 360 degrees, not have to move his palette, not have to stand up. He could now paint faster and get the job done sooner. I'm actually looking for, over the couple of years, a modern day application of this device. And really what it is kind of like is the first remote control. Because really he's sitting down and everything else is going on around him. But they didn't have this next expression back then. But by today's standards, you know what this is truly an example of? Thinking outside the box. Leonardo da Vinci thought outside the box for this one. Getting into the heart of Leonardo da Vinci, Leonardo da Vinci was left-handed. You know what left, being left-handed meant back then? The sign of the devil, the mark of the devil, and all the writing instruments were set up for right-handed people. So if you were left-handed and you were using a writing instrument of the day and you wrote left to right like we do, it would smear the page. So Leonardo da Vinci th taught himself to write left-handed backwards from right to left. They call that mirror script. At the Museum of Leonardo da Vinci, they teach young students that every year, and they teach them to do the young students with mirrors. They hold a mirror up to the right-hand side of the page, and they write from right to left. Can you think of another reason why he wanted to do that? His own copyright. If somebody ran off with his drawings, they'd have a very, very hard time figuring it out. As you may know, Leonardo da Vinci did the first major anatomical drawings in history. In fact, all of our medical drawings today are based upon his original drawings. His best friend died at an early age, and he wondered why his best friend passed away. Leonardo da Vinci performed an autopsy on his best friend. What was that problem? It was against the law. It was a criminal offense. But he didn't care. He wanted to find out why his best friend passed away. He performed an autopsy on his best friend. Can you imagine? He cut open his best friend. He found his best friend's heart, found all the arteries going to his best friend's heart were what? Clogged and he theorized, and probably correctly, that what his best friend had eaten had killed him. And after that, he became a strict vegetarian. And he lived to be 67 years of age, which was very long for back then. His own apprentices turned him in, and the last years of his life, he had to move from Italy to France, which I'll talk about in just a few minutes. Very recently, 60 Minutes did a magazine article called The Monks of Mount Athos. And Google this when you get a chance. I'd, like, I'd love you to pull it up. 60 Minutes sent a film crew over to the Monks of Mount Athos Monastery where they have been living the same way above the Aegean Sea for the last 550 years. They grow all their own fruits, all their own vegetables, all their own herbs. And you know what? They have no cancer. They have no heart disease. They have no Alzheimer's. So Leonardo da Vinci was right 550 years ago to eat well and to take great care of yourself. What's the problem that's happened over the last 550 years? What's changed? Nothing. We're still eating what's killing us. All the young students that come by this exhibit, they walk by this particular exhibit and they, and, they, and they take one look at it and they think, oh, this is nothing. You know what this nothing did? This nothing changed the world that we live in. Leonardo da Vinci figured out by attaching levers to the back of a turning wheel, you would turn circular motion into linear energy. The locomotive, the internal combustion engine, the piston, is all based on this theory and design. Leonardo da Vinci figured out by attaching weights to a moving object that once the energy was being created by the individual, it could be sustained, sustained longer, and sustained evenly. Leonardo da Vinci designed the original flywheel as we know it today. Leonardo da Vinci designed a lantern style wheel. What I mean by lantern style, it's larger at the top and small at the bottom. So to connect the two pieces of the wood, the bars had to be at an angle. So on a central column next to it, all these gears had to be at a different size to connect properly with the lantern wheel. As the workman turned the lantern style wheel, each one of these gears now turns at its own rate. Where do we use that every day? Every automatic transmission is based upon this principle. This is a General Motors 350 cubic inch engine. 
The reason we, that we introduced this into the exhibition is because we have the young school groups that come here, the young children, when they get hit with this, all this imagination, all this creativity, they have a hard time filtering this and putting all this together. And they think, how in the world does all this fit in my life? What does all this mean? What we've done is we've taken apart this General Motors cu uh, cubic inch engine. This here is what they call a camshaft. The only thing that's the difference between this camshaft and the cam hammer that we showed earlier is there was only one cam hammer. In here, we, they lined up 16 cam hammers is all they did. And they calibrated each one of these measurements as the cam hammer moves around to lift up the rocker arms, let the gas in and the exhaust out as the engine operates. Connected to the camshaft is we know what this is now, is Leonardo da Vinci's worm screw that connects the entire camshaft to the engine. On the side over here, is what they call a solid flywheel. The only thing that's different between this flywheel and Leonardo da Vinci's original design is they took all the, all the pieces, all the weights, and they connected them in one piece. They didn't want extraneous objects floating around getting caught in the engine, so they took all the weights and they connected them and they balanced them. It's also called a harmonic balancer, but basically what it is, is a one-piece flywheel. Connected to the one-piece flywheel is Leonardo da Vinci's link chain that he designed for the bicycle 550 years ago. We've taken the head off the engine to expose the piston, and as you know, the piston is, is connected to the crankshaft. And as the gas explodes, it pushes the piston down, it turns the crankshaft and moves this thing forward. I want you to do this when you get a chance. I googled this the other day, and I asked, how many patents do you think General Motors has on this engine? General Meadows has over 3,000 patents on this engine. And every one of the patents that moves this engine forward, except for the spark plug, is from Leonardo da Vinci. Where do you hear this one? Over the last 300 years, Leonardo da Vinci has been credited with designing the automobile and foreseeing the automobile as we know it today. Everything was based upon this cart design and even our own explanatory notes say it was the automobile. Everything was based upon this design and the bent wood would be wound up and act like a spring-like mechanism. It would be wound up, it would slowly unwind like a spring-like effect. It would go 50 meters and stop. But we had nothing else to compare it to so we figured, well of course he meant the automobile. There was one design problem that we couldn't quite come to terms with. And that is if you sat or you stood on this cart-like design, it was very unstable. So if he meant this to be an automobile, it would have been very unstable, but we had nothing else to compare it to. So we figured, well, of course he meant the automobile. Well, over the last four years at the Museum of Leonardo da Vinci, they're still putting together the pieces of the da Vinci puzzle. He had 44,000 drawings, of which only 14,000 survived. And plus he was one of the greatest painters in the world that ever lived. And now they've now determined, you know what? He didn't invent the automobile as we know it today. When he moved from Italy to France, the last years of his life, King Francis I welcomed him with open arms to, to France. He gave him a place to stay on his own estate. He gave him a pension that he could live out the rest of his life in peace. The, Francis I was quoted as saying, the only thing I want is the pleasure of Leonardo da Vinci's company. And when Leonardo da Vinci arrived in France from Italy, he wanted to give the King Francis I an unbelievable gift that he could think of. Now we know it wasn't the automobile, but it was the bottom operating mechanism to his mechanical lion robotic design to the King of France. He designed a mechanical lion robot that was designed to be wound up, designed to go 50 meters. It was designed to roar up like a lion. And when it roared up like a lion, its chest was to open and flowers and lilies and doves were to fly out in tribute to the king. How cool is that? So we now know it wasn't the automobile that we always thought it was, but it was another one of his mechanical robotic designs that he gave as a gift to the King of France upon his arrival for welcoming him to France the last years of his life. I'd like to thank you for joining us today here at the Da Vinci Machines Exhibition. But before we leave, I do have a couple of closing thoughts for you that I'd like to share with you. First of all, the name of this exhibit, which we named it, the Da Vinci Machines Exhibition, is what it is. But on all of our advertisement, on all of our themes, our, the theme of this exhibit is Discover the Da Vinci in You. And why did we name it that? When I first got involved with this project over two and a half years ago, 
and I first realized that he had 44,000 drawings, of which only 14,000 survived, plus he was one of the greatest painters that ever lived. And we walk through this exhibit, we see these absolutely magnificent machines that brought us into the modern era. You know what I began to think about? What was in the 30,000 we lost? If you love this next story, in 1899, Charles Durrell, you can Google this guy, D-U-E-L-L, -L, Charles Durrell was head of the U.S. Patent Office in Washington, D.C. In 1899, you know what he, Charles did? He sent a letter over to Congress. And in his letter, do you know what he said? He said, you can go ahead and close the U.S. Patent Office because everything that had ever been designed, ever been dreamed, had ever been invented had already taken place. Wow, was that guy dead wrong or what? I'm a huge Beatle fan. And in this interview, this interviewer asked Mr. McCartney this great question. He said, hey, Paul, I got a question for you. Do you ever think there's ever going to be another Beatles? And what do you think Paul said? Paul said, of course there is. Just out of proportion to the number of people in the world. The human race is still at its infancy. Of course there's going to be another Beatles. Do you know what I ask the young students that come through every day? Do you ever think there's going to be another Leonardo da Vinci? And you know what the answer is? Of course there is. And do you know what I tell them? The next Leonardo da Vinci could be right here in this room. You know what I have to do every day we, when we get up? We got to think outside the box. We got to dream, imagine, and create, and wonder. I've got three daughters. And they're all, one's, one's in the late teens, and my two are in the early 20s. And you know what? They hate it when I tell them this. They love it when I tell them this. No, they hate it when I tell them this. You know what I tell them? I tell them every day when they get up, they have to turn off these iPhones. Because if you don't, I will decree from this day forward, nothing else in this world will ever happen. Because you know what we need? We need time to dream and imagine and create and wonder. Michelangelo had the greatest quote in history. You know what Michelangelo said? Michelangelo said the sculpture that he was about to create was already there inside the stone. It was just his job to break off the outside. How incredible is that? Do you know what this means? It means we all got it. We all have to figure out a way to get to it. So every day I tell the young students to get up, to think outside the box, to dream and wonder and create and imagine. And I also tell them, pick something in your life. I don't care what it is, whether it's science or math or music or art. I don't care what it is. Study it. Learn it. Become an expert at it. So every day when you get up and when you turn around when you're 25 and you're 30 and you're 40, you know what you can say to yourself? That's who I am. That's what I've become because I've studied and I've learned it. And this has become a part of me. And you know what happens along that journey? You discover who you are the greatest challenge we have every day when we get up in our life. But you know what else will happen? You'll discover your inner Da Vinci and you'll discover the Da Vinci in you. Thank you so much.